and I'll introduce myself as people are um, coming in. My name is Julie Siglin. I'm the director of the Wharton Usher Museum. I'm really excited about today's program uh, for, for lots of reasons. Um, the Ashwick Museum has been closed for the better part of a year now. We were briefly open last fall. We're in a period where we normally would be closed every year in January, February. That used to be for snow. Um, it's now more for preservation projects, deep cleaning, things like that, uh, that we have a chance to do those things. We hope to be open uh, later in the spring or early summer, depending on what, what COVID brings. But uh, this program today is indicative of uh, the virtual world that we've embraced as a result of COVID, a silver lining, if you will. And it's shown us that we can uh, bring in an audience from, from far afield across the country, even across the world, um, and build a new audience. And it's been really fun to connect with, with new people, um, including people like Sarah on the other coast. Um, this is our third Creatives on Extra talk. We've done a total of 13 posts. Those are all available on our website. Our Director of Curatorial Affairs, uh, Emily Zilber, is going to do a proper introduction of Sarah in a minute, but I'll just say uh, before I pass it over to her that it was October of 2019, which seems like a very, very, very long time ago at this point, that I had uh, the real pleasure of introducing Sarah to the studio uh, in person for her first visit. And that is something in my total of maybe seven years of introducing people to Escherich's built environment that never gets old and is always a pleasure. But I don't know that I've ever um, enjoyed it as much as I did that night. It was with a small group of woodworkers who had pieces in the show, uh, making a seat at the table that had just opened at the Center for Art and Wood in Old City, Philadelphia. And the intensity with which Sarah took in that environment uh, was something. And I think we have photographic evidence of that that we're gonna show later in the program. Uh, so I'm really excited and I'm gonna uh, get it moving and I will introduce you all to Emily Zilber, the Wharton Eshrick Museum Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships to kick it off. Thanks, Julie. Um, and hello, everyone. I see some familiar faces from our other virtual program. So it's nice to see, nice to see you back and I see some new faces as well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope that you'll join us again on February 24th at noon. That'll be when our next free spotlight talk takes place. We're gonna highlight Eshrick's World's Fair chair during that talk, looking at prototypes, evolutions in its design, and exploring its connection to the 1939-1940 World's Fair, um, which was all themed around the world of tomorrow. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, as, as Julie mentioned, today's talk came about as a result of creatives on Eshrick. Um, we're so pleased that it brought Sarah Watlington into our orbit <laughs> and, and that we can spend some more time with her today. I'm gonna give her a, a bio here. Sarah Watlington describes herself, and I'm gonna quote her here, as an artist who works primarily with wood as well as within the parameters of function. She's written a really beautiful text for creatives on Eshrick that I hope you'll read if you haven't read it already. Um, but I was really especially struck by her assertion, and I'm gonna use her own words against her here as well, um, that I'm, to quote, Eshrick was the first woodworker whose creative language I wanted to speak the etymology of which can be found throughout my work. Sarah is a graduate of the Krenov School of Fine work, Woodworking in Fort Bragg, California, and holds a BFA in design from the Design Institute of San Diego. She's the project manager at Offerman Woodshop in Los Angeles. And I think we're, we're chatting with her today from, from that space um, where she designs and builds custom furniture. She also teaches woodworking at Allied Woodshop. Uh, I know that we're looking forward and we're hoping it happens that Sarah will be here in Philadelphia for the Center um, for Art and Woods ITE Wingate residency in the summer of 2021. And I hope that, that many local folks here will have a chance to get to know her um, through her time in our city. Um, so we're gonna have about 30, 30 minutes of conversation. We'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. I'll ask you to please um, mute yourselves while we're doing uh, the conversation. And then you can either unmute um, to ask questions or put them in the chat and we'll make sure that we answer them. Um, and with that, I'm gonna 
say hello to Sarah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Welcome. Emily. Thank you. <laughs> We're happy to have you here. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I just want to get started with, with you know, a, a, a pretty broad question. When and how did you first encounter Eshrick's work and sort of what was it about the work that first interested you? Sure. Uh, well, I think it was about 2012 when I first discovered Escherich's work, and I can't remember how I did. I was a really young and enthusiastic woodworker at the time, and I was just trying to soak in everything I could. So I probably found him online and kind of poured over his images of his work. And as much as the things that he made uh, interested me at the time, I was equally as drawn to his lifestyle, his kind of fusion of his creative practice and his life and his work. At the time, that was a really big project for myself as well. I had been building for a couple of years, doing carpentry, building small living structures. I had built one that I was living in at the time. And I had also started a warehouse with friends that had a wood shop and a print shop and all these other shared resources. And so to me, uh, to teach myself woodworking, I figured I would just build everything I could in my environment from the structures all the way down to the furniture. And uh, that was how I was gonna teach myself. And that was kind of the project at the time. And yeah, so I found Escherich's work and I was like, oh my God, here's someone who had actually done that. He had built his whole studio, his home, everything down to the door, doorknobs and latches. And I just, poured over his work and really, really idolized what he accomplished seemingly in his lifetime. And yeah, at the time that was a very political act for me. It was kind of a uh, resistance against, I guess what you should call the alienation of everyday life, alienation from our work, um, alienation from each other through individualism and alienation from our own bodies. And so, uh, I had hoped that maybe that was kind of his project as well. And I have learned since, since then that maybe Emily, you and I have spoken about this some, that maybe that wasn't quite his project. He was very much into experimental living, but maybe the, the political side of the intention wasn't, wasn't there. So that's all been really interesting to learn. Uh, I also have a much better class analysis now about how, how most people are afforded uh, the ability to like completely follow their creative pursuits and passions. He came from a very privileged background and existed in worlds with a lot of wealth and uh, resources. So, so with all that said, I mean, nothing takes away from, from the impact that his work has had on my own over the years. Uh, I just maybe have a little bit less idealized impression of, of the, of the life that he lived and my yeah, own. <laughs> I, think I think this often happens when we discover an artist who really, um, you know, makes our, makes our heart beat fast. We also dig into the biography and, and there's the impact of what they make and how it makes us feel. And then the story of their life. And sometimes those two take us in different places, but often they can, they can come together at really critical moments for us. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I still, I still reference his work. I still, get excited when I see images of it. And I really look forward to going back to the museum again and just getting to spend time there. And so um, that's wonderful. I'm curious if you can <laughs> talk a little bit about um, your times visiting the Escher Komen studio. I know Julie mentioned that she was able to host you there and how seeing the work in context, in context sort of built um, into this understanding that, that you were building a sort of asterisk, not just as a, as a maker, but as a sort of holistic character. Yeah, I think that getting to finally go to a studio after so many years of appreciating his work um, was honestly everything I hoped it would be in terms of my impression of his work. Um, you know, people talk about it as kind of a pilgrimage and it definitely felt like like that a bit and it was also really wonderful Julie mentioned she gave us this really special tour and, and I'm we, actually going to share the screen to show some great. of those images that we were oh, yeah I chatting about so if you'll you continue talking and oh. bear with me <laughs> sure 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 um so yeah so 
uh, that's my house that I built. It happened to be in a tree. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Uh, unnecessarily high in a tree. Just Eshrick's, Eshrick's studio on the hillside on Valley Forge Mountain <laughs> and your studio also elevated, but in but in this fantastic, or no, not your studio, your, your living space elevated into this fantastic tree I house. Did, I did live in that tree house. <laughs> This was his, this was his workshop. This is what we got to see that I think, am I correct that people don't normally get to see on the regular tour? Yeah, so this is the 1956 workshop that is not currently open to the public. Right, so, so we were able to go and see it and we also got to meet Bob, his son-in-law who, I'm so sorry, he passed away this past year, um, but it was really wonderful to meet him and get to see the workshop space and just get this really intimate experience of Eshrick and, um, yeah, just really personalized him in a nice way. We got to hear about his relationship with his children and his really special relationship with his daughter and uh, his wife, Letty, and her role in their lives and her really integral role in his success as an artist because she took up a lot of the responsibility of child rearing as often happens. So it was just, you know, it just added to the richness and the layers of understanding him as not just a maker, but a person as well um, in all of its complexity as we all are. And, and I'm gonna show the picture here of um, you guys having this yay. conversation in the <laughs> It's fun to have that moment documented. Oh, that was so wonderful. Yeah, so we got to get a whole tour and then we just sat in the entryway. Um, I think I'm, maybe am I sitting on the spiral staircase or, or very near it? <laughs> Uh, and, we just, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we just talked for a couple hours about really interesting things about Eshrick, but also about ideas and our own work. And yeah, I guess I would say that that visit helped me kind of just reinforced the understanding that, you know, as makers, a lot, I think a lot of people think about is what I'm doing worthwhile or is there enough stuff in the world do I need to be making anything else? But understanding that like legacy is also a really powerful thing and that if you inspire other people and bring people together and it brought us together that day, it's bringing us together now, maybe it will inspire other people to kind of carry on other traditions that, yeah, it's just, um, we are more than the physical objects that we leave behind. So mm -hmm. that was just a really reassuring and nice nice understanding after visiting the museum. I'm curious if um, if there's spaces or sort of vignettes in the studio that you find particularly meaningful. Well, all of them, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. Um, I know we've spoken a little bit about, about the sculpture well, so I'm gonna bring. Please, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one kept coming to mind for me, um, particularly the translucent, glass silhouetting the small maquettes and sculptures that was kind of my favorite zone um, I, I think that the small sculptures were just really precious and I really like the way that they're balanced between um, in in relation to the really large sculptures that are next to it I think that is just this really interesting kind of contrast between the intimate and the monumental, which I think Eshrick did really well, which not a lot of people can do really well, I think, because they're very different things and they create, evoke really different responses um, mm. to people engaging with them. So I really loved it for a bunch of reasons. I also think, you know, people speak of it as this kind of religious church-like experience to come into the space. And I think probably this, this view has a lot to do with it. It has a very, very um, powerful, impressionable, kind of spiritual feeling to it. And, uh, and then also just the, the models themselves. I love scale models. Um, <laughs> I will praise the gospel of uh, working with scale models to anyone who will listen <laughs> because they just teach you so much about the things that you're gonna make in full scale. And they give you, I think working in scale models give you, gives you a lot of courage to create things that are maybe more experimental or more original because you work out a lot of the the mysteries of what they'll look like in a small scale. And, and I think we have this, this is, can you talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yeah, that, that's my most recent commission I made. Um, 
It's a dining table out of white oak. And that is the tiny little model that I made before making the table. And I always love setting it on top of the final piece because they always seem to have a really um, strong relationship. <laughs> they always look identical, even though I think I changed things along the way, but uh, apparently I don't because they always look real, really, really similar. Do you, do you keep the models or did the model go to the, the person who commissioned? You keep the models and, and so you, yeah. I have a big, I have a big box of models. Um, yeah, clients are funny about the models. Sometimes, sometimes they like them. Sometimes they're totally indifferent to them. I, I always try and show them, but they don't seem, sometimes they're just like, oh, thank you, dollhouse. And I'm like, no, really? <laughs> You're like, no, this, this taught is... me everything I needed to know about your project. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is a piece of problem solving, um, not, not writ large, writ small, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm struck um, in looking at this piece, the sort of beautiful simplicity of it. And, and I know that in our conversations, we've talked about um, this simple wooden vessel that's in Eshrick's kitchen as a kind of touchstone for you. And um, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why this particular object is meaningful for you and, and how it relates to your own sort of understanding of simplicity and its role in your work. Sure, yeah, I, when I was trying to figure out what to write about, I just really kept going back to this vessel because I think it was the first thing of his that I saw that I thought I could understand at the time I had no no furniture making skills just aspirations and so mm. a lot of the furniture was so impressive in a way that I just couldn't understand at all and so I really wanted to make things that resembled his work and I settled upon this vessel because I thought it was really beautiful and I thought it was simple enough and um, I, like I said in my writing I I tried to recreate it and I, I failed miserably. <laughs> I don't think I made it even very far. First, I got the scale wrong. I, I, I thought it was maybe like a, like a large vessel. And my first issue was like, where to even find a piece of wood that big? And then anyways, that's not an interesting story, but the cup means a lot to me. It's actually quite small. <laughs> it's actually about that big, which was an interesting thing to learn when I went to the museum. Um, but that, that piece has always had a really big impact on me it seems really simple, you know, to do sweeping spines like that, like I mentioned, is really difficult to do. And I think in, in general simplicity, I think simplicity being deceptively difficult is, can be interpreted in a couple different ways in different contexts. I, I think the quote that I used with um, Constantine Brancusi in my piece was more about abstract sculpture. And I think that is very true and that simplicity is this thing that we arrive at when we reach the true essence of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really beautiful and I think that's really true. And when you look at his sculptures or Escherich sculptures, abstract sculptures, uh, that really rings true. You know, somehow this like, this like spire of, of cast metal somehow evokes like the birds in flight and you don't really mm -hmm. understand why, but they do. Um, and then in a furniture making sense, I think simplicity being a difficult task is, uh, I think it's easy to make complicated things look complicated. And I think it's a challenge that I enjoy to make complicated things look uncomplicated and, and quiet. And I think that that's maybe a good way that you could describe a lot of my work is kind of quiet quiet complexity. Um, mm. These shamal ash side tables that I made about a year and a half ago are maybe a good example of that. They look pretty monolithic and simple and they look like maybe they're not made of that many pieces of wood. Um, but in their construction, there's a lot of complexity to get the compound angles and then they're all connected with splines as a challenge. And then uh, I really, paid a, a lot of attention to the grain graphics in all of them. The, the smaller one on the right, which is the one in front in the other photo. Uh, it, it, I don't know if you can see, so the top looks like just maybe two nicely book match pieces. But if you look mm -hmm. at that front little edge, uh, I think there's about eight edge joints in that top, <laughs> uh, like mm -hmm. eight thin pieces of wood glued together. 
Um, and the point is for you not to really be able to tell because there were knots and little inconsistencies that I wanted that top to be really continuous. And then as, as well as the bottoms, you're cutting the trapezoid out of a rectangle. And so to align the graphics in certain ways, I had to actually kind of assemble a rectangle around the graphics that I wanted. And mm. I don't think anyone notices that, those <laughs> things. <laughs> But, it, but overall, it lends itself to kind of a, a gentleness that I think is, is more successful than, it's a lot easier to yell and be heard than, than speak uh, quietly and be heard, so. It also speaks to this notion of sort of attention as, um, as an artistic tool, right? This, mm -hmm. is the, the, this piece requires a sort of, um, uh, working in that way requires a, a level of attention and concentration and focus. Um, uh, and that's part of your your toolkit as an artist, and I and I think that probably we can say the same of Eshrick as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that even though you have this really um, sort of pared down and 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 often um, uh, simple and complex at the same time language, you've really found yourself interested in um, the animal forms and the role that um, sort of drawing from nature in that way plays in Eshrick's work. And, and I'm gonna show, um, you know, if you wanna talk a little bit about some of the images that we pulled out here and what, what sort of is striking about them to you and then we'll relate them back to, to some of your work. Sure. Uh, well, I think that Eshrick maybe had more intention in the way that his work relates to, at least with some of his pieces, in the mm. way that his re work relates to animals. I mean, he made many sculptures that were animals. And and we're showing I, here, this is um, an image from the uh, exhibition that he had in 1958-1959 at the um, Museum of Contemporary Crafts, so um, MAD, now in New York. Hmm. That's good to know. I didn't actually know where that, where it came from. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But animal, I mean, his reference to animals are sometimes really explicit. Um, but even in his furniture, maybe in the next photo, mm -hmm. I just picked out one of his chairs because I think all of his furniture kind of has this animalistic sense of movement. And I think it has a lot to do with the stance of things. And I also think it has to do with maybe the originality of the form. I think that yeah. furniture inspired by other furniture looks like furniture <laughs> <laughs> in a traditional sense. And then yeah. if you're kind of drawing from inspiration from the natural world or other, other things, then it often takes a more animalistic or anthropomorphic shape uh, and I know that dance and movement had a lot to do with his work as well. So maybe that's the inspiration. But I, as far as my personal work, um, I tend to make things that look like animals. I can't actually say that it's intentional. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just what happens. <laughs> um, the heron chair has a very, a very bird-like stance, kind of sits up. Uh, I kind of felt like the legs and the head were kind of uh, heron, heron-esque. And also I think the stance, <clears throat> similar, similar to that, that chair behind, maybe the stance, some, something about it just speaks of, of movement that um, traditional, maybe like more, more rectilinear furniture doesn't. Um, it's, it's a chair that looks like if you don't sit down in it quickly, it might walk away on, you, you know what I mean? It might spring <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> unseated. That's I mean, really I think good. I think that um, you know I, I think about Estrick's interest in um, Steiner and anthroposophy and this idea of of sort of embodying the way that things grow in mm. objects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that being very dear and central to to the way that he was looking at the world and whether that is the growth of um, a plant or the way that an animal moves or the way that a person dances and uses their body, that, that because they're all part of, of the world, they have these similarities. And so I think you're, I think you're right on um, in connecting those kinds of, um, you know, 
this interest in animals to the interest in the movement of dance to the interest in in sort of the world writ large using that all and seeing it all as, as points of inspiration and reference. Definitely and just like a general reverence for the natural world it I think can come through and that that I think that's a big part of it for myself this kind of animist feeling of of having a lot of deep respect for things um, having their own essence and spirit more than just us humans you know we're not we're not the only <laughs> the only sentient things I feel like so and he he um, he clearly had a deep love for the natural world having placed himself in the middle of it when maybe it would have suited him more to live in the city surrounded by his clientele and his architecture in his house um, I didn't think to ask for a picture of that but I think it has a very like organic version of the Frank Lloyd Wright ethos of blending into the natural world versus standing out. And the fact that there are no, very few straight lines or no 90 degree corners, at least seemingly from the outside, I think that does a really good job of helping it blend in because straight lines and 90 degrees really, really stand out because they don't exist in nature. <laughs> right. And, and certainly to him, uh, a straight line took no thought. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they're much more complex too, right? They right. don't exist in nature and they're much more interesting. So, so that's exactly. clearly the path to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I, I, uh, another sort of point of connection between, between you two that I think is so fascinating is this link that you both um, draw from, from literature and writing, certainly, um, Eshrick's relationship with the writers in his circle, um, like Sherwood Anderson and Theodore Dreiser, and then, you know, his, um, I think, interest in narrative that comes from illustrating books and thinking about the relationship of the word and an image or the word and an object. Um, Oh, you know what? Actually, what, let's let's skip that question and, and chat about these guys before we move on to that, because <laughs> they're fabulous. Can you tell oh. us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Thank you. Um, <laughs> these are just a, a, a number of small things that I've made mostly over the last year. And I just included them because I don't, maybe it's obvious they're all birds. <laughs> Even this geometric clay vessel that I made that's sitting in front just somehow still looks like a bird. So that was just to reinforce my point that I have no control over <laughs> the things that I make looking like animals. And I know clay is <laughs> that's all. Exciting to you right now. I know you've, you've started working with that more. Um, so I know we'll that's all be true. really excited to see the direction that that goes in. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, to your, to your point about literature, um, well, it's been really fun to learn about Escherich's relationship with the various authors and writers that he has relationships with. I think that that kind of cross-pollination is really fruitful. And um, this piece is mine and there's a really direct uh, connection to literature because it's based on a book, uh, Autobiography of Red by Ann Carson, which is, um, it's actually a novel in verse. So it's pretty much a, a really long poem with a narrative uh, and poetry for me is what I'm most drawn to I think I think it it does the best job trying to give voice to the really complicated human experience that I feel like sometimes grammar <laughs> and things that require more like structure and control can't can't do so mm. I really love poetry um, and Ann Carson is an incredible poet. She's one of my favorites. And so the book is based on uh, the autobiography of a young man. And he's also a young man, but she draws a lot um, from Greek mythology. And this story specifically is a re in reference to the, the myth of Geryon and Heracles. And so Geryon, the main character, is a, is a young boy in the story, but then there's also this like magical mythological element to it where he's also a monster with six arms, six legs and wings. Mm. And so the desk was originally kind of for him, but then it, it quickly kind of became him as well. These, the members that float around the outside are his six arms, his wings are underneath 
Uh, there's a lot of metaphor and visual Im imagery to draw from in the book and uh, the color red, volcanoes, uh, lots of things that I'm forgetting now, but. <laughs> I'm wondering if we, I'm gonna show um, another angle of the piece, which I just think is so, so beautiful. And, Thank and you. thinking about these as sort of arms that are holding and, the, and that are sort of bearing forth um, this object, I think it gives it a, a real depth of meaning that is that is quite beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that was, um, I haven't tried to do anything I haven't tried to do that again. I don't know, maybe this is a detriment to my own practice, but I don't normally do things more than once. And that mm. project was really organic and came about in this really natural way. And so I haven't actually tried to do, maybe I should, it was it was really fun and still my favorite project. And it has a really good story. I actually ended up reaching out to Ann Carson and gifting her the desk and I drove it all the way across the country with a dear friend of mine and <laughs> gave it to her <laughs> and spent the day with her. And that was a really um, maybe peak moment in my life. Um, <laughs> but now she writes poetry on it, which is everything I ever wanted. And um, I think there's also a picture of the stool. There is, yeah. Yeah, so the stool, this is the underside of the stool because that's where all the cool things happen. But the stool uh, accompanies the desk and there has six legs. So there's the six arms and wings and the legs. And um, and yeah, I mean, and then maybe to like bring it back to Escherich, just really, like I mentioned, I think it, it is really cool to hear about his relationships with different authors. And I directly that he like uh, illustrated for different books, but also that I would imagine a lot of the things that he made were also inspired by their work as well. And um, in doing research for this, I came across a piece I hadn't seen before, which I think we have a picture of next. Mm -hmm. And it was his, the one on the left and the one that the little girl is standing in front of is called Reverence. And it's his, it was the tombstone that he made for his friend Sher Sherwood Anderson when he passed away. And I, <laughs> I just am tickled by it because it's so dark and macabre <laughs> and I feel like you really have to know someone to present this as the thing that will loom over them for all eternity <laughs> <laughs> so it's really beautiful and I guess it was made out of one one perfect perfect log of walnut um, and then I guess his, his uh, Sherwood's wife nixed it and chose something more practical <laughs> Which is which, still beautiful, but you can imagine that being the tombstone for many people as opposed right. to <laughs> <laughs> reverence really seems like, you know, the, the uh, yes, it seems singular in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious. It's it's so lovely to me to hear that that um, Anne is writing poetry on on your desk and, and it sounds like you've stayed connected with her. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about what that relationship means to you, taking something from the inspiration that um, a person's written word offers into sort of a relationship between two people and knowing that your creativity is continuing to build hers. Yeah, I guess just, well, I think to say we're friends is maybe a little bit of a stretch. That would be <laughs> ideal, <laughs> but we do communicate. I'll reach out a couple times a year and say, it hasn't fallen off the wall yet. How are you doing? And we chat a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, I think what you said is just, and what I kind of referenced earlier that uh, re reciprocity between creative minds, especially in different mediums, it can just be so fruitful and, um, I'd like to think that she is inspired writing on the desk and making extra incredible work because of it. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't doubt that she is. I think, I think, I think writing on something that you know <laughs> has been made through your own it's uh you know through through the power of of, of your words is, yeah. is probably a pretty potent thing. Yeah I'm, I think I'm the... curious sir, if you can talk a little bit about like oh, I'm sorry go ahead. No, go ahead go ahead go ahead no, 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 you, you, <laughs> you, you say, say what you're going to say. What was I going to say? Uh, I think I was maybe going <laughs> to just talk a little bit more about the relationship between language and sculpture, which I think is interesting because mm. 
they seemingly occupy really different dimensions, obviously, but uh, I think there's actually a lot of relationship between the two, both having form and both evoking feeling. And I think that, um, I think there's kind of like en endless inspiration to draw between the two. Yeah, yeah, that it's, and, and in some ways it's interesting. It's the same, um, uh, your comment about sort of when you're inspired when you make furniture based on furniture, right? It seems, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at the natural world, you're looking at language, and then there's moments of confluence when you look outside of the sort of structures of, of your discipline and the forms that um, are expected, even when it's across to something that um, seemingly has a totally different setup and structure. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. I'm curious if you can if you can share a little bit about what you're most excited about in your work right now um, before we open things up for questions. Sure. Um, well, furniture will always be my kind of bread and butter, um, but I really have been enjoying the last couple months uh working with clay, which mm. um, made just a couple small things that I made shows there. And I think for the last year or so, I've really been gearing up to kind of step out of the realm of functionality and kind of focus more on sculpture, non-functional mm. sculpture. I think that I really love furniture. I think that you can say a lot more with things that their function is to, to speak on a concept versus, you know, serving a, a functional function. Mm. And so I have been making small sculptures out of clay and I'm really excited to explore other materials as well. And I think actually the relationship between clay and wood um, is really exciting to me. I think using the skills that I have from woodworking and applying them to really interesting ideas that kind of mesh the two together is something that I've been playing with a lot. And I'm in the process of setting up a studio space that'll give me room to make larger sculptures. I have a couple, couple big ideas. One involves many, many um, ceramic bells, which should be mm. fun. And let's see, another one involves, is actually a memorial uh, sculpture for a friend who passed away from cancer last year. And it involves um, large ceramic hollow boulders <laughs> and fishing rods. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I've just, I, I'll continue to do furniture. I really love furniture. I think I think I understand the language of furniture and I, I really enjoy it as a craft and I'm really excited to kind of see where making art takes me. And the next couple of months I'll be gearing up for, like you mentioned, doing the residency at the Center for Art and Wood which will give me a lot of space to explore that because that's the point of the residency. I'm, I'm glad that's on the horizon for you. And I'm glad hopefully we'll get to see, those of us here in, in, in the Philadelphia area, will get to see it happen in real time. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time and, and, and thoughts about your work. And I, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, if folks want to unmute and, and ask a question or you can put something in the chat, um, either, way, either way works. I can make a comment. Um, Hi, Rob. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you again for another wonderful presentation. Sarah, thank you for some really wonderful information and things to make us think. Uh, I wanted to give some context on the Sherwood Anderson grave marker. Oh, cool. I don't know if anybody at the museum is aware of this. Bob Bascom shared this with me. Rob, that will you check in and tell people who you are in relation to the museum? <laughs> okay, I'm the former, I was a director at the museum for 20 years and oh, cool. uh, got to know the family very well. Um, and Bob shared very, quite a few personal stories about his relationship with Eshrick. And there's a photo of Sherwood Anderson on his property. It's up in Eshrick's bedroom. And there's a gentleman standing next to him. And it's a man that worked his farm. I believe his first name was John. And when Anderson died, Eshrick observed John standing next to the grave site originally at the day of the funeral. Hmm. And Eshrick said everywhere they went, John would be wandering around and he'd find some kind of stick or staff and stand holding a staff. 
Wherever you were in the farm, in the woods, John will always have a staff. And Eshrick saw him that way at the graveside when mm. Sherwood Anders was buried. So that's a rel relatively universal image, of course, but it's very, very personal. It's John mm -hmm. mourning his friend, Sherwood Anderson. And uh, that's where it stood for a while at the grave site. And Anderson's widow said, it's just gonna deteriorate out there in the elements. So that's when Eshrick came up with that curved linear concrete piece. Uh, so it's an extremely personal piece, which like I say has a great universal res resonance as well. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really sure. interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> I know that um, Sandy here in the oh, we have a question here. The idea of a memorial sculpture that weathers and disintegrates, right? It it it's. Uh, <laughs> really plays with the idea of what a memorial means and what it's supposed to do, doesn't it? <laughs> I also noticed that Peter asks, or says it looks like those tabletops have a shallow angle. It's true, the underside is, is tapered so that there was more room for joinery. Side note, <laughs> I'm just, I'm looking at the <laughs> chat. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm seeing here too that Sandy is, is noting that she loves the idea of relating other art forms, in this case a poem, to sculpture and furniture. She's also infatuated with words. And I think, um, I think there are a lot of artists who find, um, visual artists who find power in, in either writing themselves or in reading poetry or what other, others have written. Um, are there other, other questions or other things that are on folks' minds? I have a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Sarah. I'm like so excited to hey, <laughs> I recognize you. <laughs> um, so listening to you speak, you know, and you talk about your work being quiet and now moving away from function into non-function because it can, its purpose is to speak. Um, I, I want to be direct and, you know, ask, what are you trying to say? But do you <laughs> Do you feel, are you kind of personally making this transition so that you can open up your own voice more and um, basically, is there something, basically, is there, yeah, is there something you're trying to say personally as an artist by transitioning? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Uh, well, I can tell you that a lot of the things that I have the ideas that I generate often have a lot to do, and maybe this is indicative of the of the year that we've had as well, but also just kind of the 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 state of the world. But a lot of the thing, the ideas that I um, come up with involve relationships of power and the ways that they can be overt and symbolic and. I guess it often, a lot of the ideas of the clay and the wood working together are kind of this like tension between those things. And there's a lot of like constraint um, and feelings of like force and control that happen between the two pieces working together. And so I think that hopefully that the things that I make that have that in mind will kind of evoke different feelings of people kind of reflecting on that because um, power is a dangerous and insidious thing and it, it surrounds us all the time and so I think it's obviously there's just like endless things to to talk about and, and I think it's worth trying to dismantle because um, power can is often violence and yeah it'd be great if that wasn't what our world was shaped on you know um, but I mean so many other things I'm not sure I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll find out as I go, but that's just one thing that came to mind. Thank you. Sure. Don is asking here, um, how do you bridge the tasks and space between um, being an artist, being a craftsperson and someone who makes a living as a studio woodworker? How do you bridge the tasks space between artist craftsman and someone who makes a living as a studio woodworker? Well, I think it's a really serious challenge. Um, I am lucky enough to have a stable 
job at a wood shop that really fosters creativity and just the craft in general. Um, and so I have that space to work on furniture. Um, and ideally I have time outside of that to work on my own artistic practice that's often pretty pretty idealistic and doesn't happen a lot of the time. I mean, I, ha I haven't made a spec piece of furniture in about a year and a half. I kind of just, between working and teaching and, and, and living, a, you know, you kind of just have to decide, am I going to make spec furniture or am I going to have friends? And I think <laughs> friends are really important. So um, <laughs> I've chosen them. But so, yeah, it's kind of a constant juggle and I, I don't have answers on how to do it. Um, Eshirk, you know, I think he had a lot of client, like repeat and consistent clients. I also feel like I see a lot of blurbs about him, how he like never made money in his life and just did it for the craft. But uh, I mean, my understanding is he had a trust fund, right? <laughs> I think there's, that's there, a really there's useful way of, to do it. <laughs> it's a, it's a truth in all of that, but certainly um, uh, there are various moments of, of success, but also challenges financially. Um, right. Right. Uh, it's not uh, it's not an easy story, <laughs> even even, you know, though he comes to it with with a certain degree of privilege that not everyone does. Right. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a hard it's a hard task to make things for your job and to find the energy to make things outside of your job as well. That's actually kind of why I've pivoted to wanting to make more sculpture. Part of why over the last couple of years is furniture has become such a, a profession for me mm. that I think I lost a little bit of the, the creative spark that I had with it because it's, it's what I do for my job. And once you, you know, job, relating to something as a job, even if you love it really much, changes the kind of the way that you relate to it. I'm, I would imagine too, that it might have something to do with why you're, you're having such a fun, fun time working with, with clay right now. Um, because even though it's still making, it's making outside of the, the sort of realm, uh, it's a different material kind of um, uh, engagement than say what you're doing when you're, when you're at the wood shop. Absolutely. Clay is so much fun. <laughs> I recommend everyone get into clay. It's, um, it's a real, it's a really nice balance between wood and it's really, I mean, it's just a very therapeutic practice. Soothing. Clay is soothing. Well, I have to say this makes me doubly excited that you're going to have the residency time to sort of just focus, not be in, in the wood shop making work for work and have some time to really just like dive into, into what's, what's going on um, internally. I want to, I want to have, we've got one last question from um, Theo before I think we're going to run out of time today. Um, he's saying for those of us new to woodworking and design, can you tell us a little bit about early breakthroughs for you in woodworking when you first started doing carpentry? Any aha moments that came to mind when practicing joinery or finishing or generally any other milestone moments on finding your voice as an artist? It's a big question, Theo. <laughs> that's, a really good, that's a really good question. Um, um, well, as far as woodworking goes, I think the aha moments finally came when I attended the Kronov School, which I did, I think maybe about five years into my woodworking where I had just taught myself everything I could uh, from the internet and books and whatnot. And mm -hmm. I think the real aha things about woodworking, the way I it was demystified for me was just realizing that to make really precise and beautiful work, you have, you go really slow, you use test pieces and you do mock-ups and you have sharp tools. And those are all just really important aspects. And then if you do that, and if you have patience with what you're doing, good results will come out of it. I think that's fabulous advice to, to end on today. Um, I want to thank everyone here for coming. Again, I want to thank Sarah so much for, for being so generous with her, with her time and, and her insight. Um, I really hope that we'll see many of you on the 24th when we have our spotlight chat. If folks want to unmute themselves and give a wave as we close out, um, it's always nice to, to say 
say goodbye to everyone. We're so happy that you gathered with us here today and we we'll hope that we'll see you. We hope that we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank You're you. Well done. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thanks for coming.